Hi guys, I am here to share my aortic dissection story. Um, my name is Terry Benson and I dissected six and a half years ago. It was October 23rd, 2012. Actually, it was the 24th because it was late into the night. Um, I it had just been an ordinary day. I'd gotten up, gone to work, gone to the gym, kind of done my thing and came home and I was getting ready for bed about 11.30 at night. And just as I was in my closet changing, I felt a stinging pain right in the middle of my chest, like a little, like the size of a 50 cent piece. And it was just a stinging. That's the only way I can explain it. It was a stinging pain. And, you know, I thought it might be kind of some kind of heartburn, but I had no idea. Um, I just kept getting ready for bed, did my routine, got in bed, and the pain, I just laid down and the pain just wasn't going away. It wasn't getting better, it wasn't getting worse, it was just kind of staying the same. But it's a pain I had never felt before. So, of course I didn't think it was anything serious. I mean, none of us ever do think it's anything serious. But I tried for probably an hour or two-ish to go to sleep. And I was super frustrated because I was tired and I had to get up at, you know, 7 a.m. and go to work the next day. So I just tried to go to sleep. And when it wouldn't stop, I grabbed my iPad and Googled stinging pain in chest. And of course, it just says, go to your doctor or go to your nearest emergency room. And I thought, I'm not doing that. So I laid back down and tried to go to sleep. And... I ended up going to the ER and I will tell you why. Um, I had laid my head back on my pillow and I had closed my eyes and I heard a voice and it was my dad's voice. And my dad died 10 years before uh, my dissection. And it wasn't a nice, his nice voice. It was like, you're in trouble voice. And it was very clear. And it was, he said, get up. And he was almost yelling, get up, put your sweats on and have McCall take you to the ER right now. And I sat up in bed and it scared me. I didn't know if I had dreamt it or if it was real, but it scared me enough that I knew I needed to listen to that voice or I would have never gone to the ER. So I did just that. I got up, my daughter McCall had been home from college for a couple of days and, and was going home the next morning so she was there and of course she's up because you know 19 year olds they don't sleep so anyway I kind of peeked into her room and I said hey will you just run me to the ER I have this dumb little pain and she was all like sure you know she's like is it bad and I'm like no but I said I just feel like I need to go get it checked so we left and long story short got to the ER walked right in no one's there and we they took me right back. I mean, I felt so stupid being there. Um, I knew it wasn't a heart attack because I had had a heart attack when I was 47 years old. I, which was, it'll be almost 10 years since I've had a heart attack. And my life was under ex an extreme amount of stress. I had three, you know, teenage kids um, a bad, bad marriage and my life was falling apart and I just was, the stress was just overwhelming. Even though I didn't realize it was killing me, it was. So I actually had a heart attack and went to the emergency room and they transferred me to a different hospital and took me right into the cath lab and they went in to like fix you know, blocked artery, you know, whatever they needed to do, and there was nothing to fix. The cardiologist was like, yeah, you've had a heart attack. You had your left ventricle is, you know, in cardiac failure, but we don't know why. So after a few days of testing and stuff, my cardiologist came in and said, I don't know what's happening in your life, but you need to make some serious changes because the, this is a typical heart attack brought on by stress. So honestly, stress kills. It does kill. <laughs> it 
Anyway, I was fortunate to have survived that. Um, and quick, just a little backstory. Nine months before that, the summer before that, I had had um, a stage three malignant melanoma, which they were sure had spread throughout my lymph system. And, you know, it was kind of a doomsday outlook on um, after I had the surgery, the melanoma surgery, what would happen. They didn't give me a whole lot of hope that, you know, I wouldn't have to go through severe treatment. And even with that, I may have a shelf life of like 10 years. Anyway, that turned out to be another miracle. I survived that without it spreading to any of my lymph system. And so anyway, I'd kind of been through a lot. And then the whole bad marriage and three teenagers or whatever. So I knew what I had to do. So I, seven months later, I filed for divorce. And so I was on my own at the age of 48. And I hadn't been alone since I was 20. So I ended up losing my house and losing everything. So I basically started over with two kids living at home. And we had to find a new home, whatever. So that all ends up working out. Um, I found a full-time job, which I didn't love, but I was grateful for it. And it had been a couple of years, and I kind of thought I was putting my life back together. And I was upcoming on my 50th birthday. And I kind of thought in my life I would never turn 50, nor would I be single at 50. So <laughs> I would kind of had a midlife breakdown. So just to kind of like relieve my stress or whatever. I, I've always been in really pretty good shape, but I was, became a little excessive and started running and biking hundreds of miles and then going to the gym every day and just, you know, kind of like running from whatever it was, turning 50 and being old and not wanting to dealing with life, not, not wanting to deal with life. So I was in amazing shape on my 50th birthday and seven weeks later I like I said it was an ordinary day October 23rd got up went to work went to the gym came home um, getting ready for bed um, end up in the ER and so first of all they take me in draw blood listen to my heart beat everything seems to be fine nothing seems too out of whack except he asked me if I had a heart murmur and I said I don't think I do but so the blood work came back normal nothing to be you know aware of blood pressure swine they you know and by the time you go through the whole process in the ER it's hours go by and the pain is getting worse and I'm getting grumpy because I'm tired and I know the clock's ticking and I need to get home and at least get a couple of hours of sleep before I go to work so I'm getting a little bit irritated that they just don't give me something and send me home. So like for the pain. And so after, you know, what seemed forever, I know it wasn't, but um, the pain did start getting worse and I could see my call, my daughter getting nervous. And like, we got to figure out what's wrong with you. So the doctor comes in and says, kind of doesn't know what to do. He's like, gosh, I just feel like maybe gosh, we should do a quick CT scan before we send you home. And I'm just like, really, is that necessary? And so went into the CT, and that's where they saw the dissection. So I came out and went back to my room, and McCall and I were sitting there. And the doctor walked in just a few minutes later and spoke a lot of words I didn't know. And said, we're rushing you to St. Mark's Hospital. Um, and you're having emergency open heart surgery. La 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 la. Okay, and then at that point, my memory is blank. I don't remember the ambulance ride. I don't remember getting to the um, critical care unit, prepping. Um, it was a very fast process, and um, I apparently had to say goodbye to my daughter and I was able to talk to one of my sons on the phone and I 
I just told them I loved them and I was proud of them and I just, I don't know, I didn't, I think my body was in so much shock, I had no idea that I was dying. So that surgery lasted about 10-ish hours. And then 24 hours later, I was back in for another eight-hour surgery. Um, I had my kidneys and my colon and my liver were in failure. They had not woke up after being frozen or whatever they, you know, cooled down, whatever, packed in ice. Anyway, um, so I only remember waking up five days later, and I woke up to my room being full of my family, like my little brother and his family was there from California, and I was like, what is everybody doing here? And I was hooked up to so much equipment, it freaked me out, and I kept thinking, what are they doing? Are they trying to kill me? I thought my family was literally like doing testing and wanted to, and was trying to kill me. So it actually, it was kind of a comical thing, but I just remember I wanted a drink and I couldn't have it because my kidneys were still iffy at that point. And I, they had taken the tube out. And so I was like, I felt like sand had been thrown down my throat. And so I, literally started yelling at my family, like, get out. I mean, get me some water or just get it done. Just kill me. Get it over with. Anyway, um, then I kind of go back out again. And the next thing I remember was um, my daughter there just by my side. And she was so happy. Oh, the other thing I forgot is that just to see my family's faces, it was like a, and I, I describe it as the horrified, grateful look. Like you can see the shock and the horrified, you know, goodness on their face, but you, you know, you don't understand why they're looking at you like they're looking at you. It's, I'm sure a lot of survivors of anything have like, like what, what are you looking at? Like, why do you look so sad and happy at the same time? Um, but just me finding out that, you know, I had gone to the ER and that I had had, you know, almost 18 hours of heart surgery or, you know, just reconstructive whatever surgery in a very short amount of time. And the fact that I was alive was a miracle. And that's all I kept hearing was, you're a miracle. You are a miracle. And I didn't fully understand, nor did I want to. I, you know, I knew what I had happened was a serious thing, but I didn't know anything about it. I knew nothing. No one I knew knew anything about it. I couldn't even remember what it was for like six months. I kept thinking, I kept asking my daughter and my friends or whoever was taking care of me, like, now what happened to me again? I just, I could not remember. Um, but I made a miraculous recovery and I was in the critical care for about two weeks and then I was only in a regular room for like maybe a couple of days and I ended up going home and that, and all I wanted to do was go home and that proved to be one of the most difficult things I've ever done. Um, the pain, just accepting my fragile and frail little body that had been through so much and was so incapable of doing anything normal. I mean, just taking a few steps was enough to like put me out for hours. Um, When I got home, my room is on the second floor, and I wanted to go up to my bed so bad. And my daughter started to help me up the seven stairs, and then the landing, and then seven more stairs. And it was about what I can compare it to is probably climbing Mount Everest. And it felt like it took that long. And that's when I think it hit me that I was really sick, like something 
terrible had happened to me and that my life had completely changed. And I didn't know what my recovery looked like. I mean, in my mind, I was always like, in a few weeks, I'm going to be fine. <laughs> that was my thing. I was, you know, in a couple more weeks, everything will be great. I'll be back to normal. And that's all I wanted to do was just go back to my normal life, which, of course, many of you know, never happens. But at the time, I just kept thinking, they had told me over and over again that, you know, your recovery is going to take at least a year. And I was so blown away. Like, how does anything take a year recovery? I mean, honestly, that, in my mind, I, I would not accept that. And so I, you know, just, I kept telling everybody, you know, I'm, a couple months, a couple weeks, whatever. I'm going to be, like, totally back to normal. I'm going back to work. I'm going, I'm going to be running. I'm going to be so excited you know, to do all these things, but yet just the smallest tasks. I mean, I couldn't lift myself. I couldn't put my arms up. I couldn't, <laughs> like, the only thing I could do, I could feed myself and I could get up and go to the bathroom, but as far as, like, washing and washing my hair, anything, getting dressed, I had to have help, and it's, um, I don't even know what you call it. It's a very humbling experience having to rely on someone to take care of your every need when in your brain, in your head, you're like, this is not right. I should be able to do it. And I had the support of a huge army, which I am so blessed. I mean, my three kids were amazing. My daughter dropped out of college because I couldn't be left alone. I had to have 24-7 care. So um, with home health care and everything, and she was a champ. I mean, she's done and seen things no daughter should ever have to do. So I, you know, and for the longest time, I wished I had died because it was so hard. And, you know, it just continued to be hard, and the progress was so slow. And I remember, like, the first time going outside, it was months. I had started going to cardiac rehab after a couple of months. And I remember vividly one time getting on the treadmill. It was my first time. And, you know, I was running sprints, like, 10 miles an hour or whatever, you know, just the day of the dissection, and she, the girl, the little physical therapist, she put the treadmill on at like 1.1, and I looked at her, and I'm like, are you kidding me? And the dude next to me is like 90, and he's got an oxygen take on, and he's like at 2.7, and I am like, that is just not right. Like, how is he going faster than I am? Like, this is not my life. But I stuck with cardiac rehab, and I did exactly what my doctor told me to do. I didn't overdo it, which is so not like me. Um, I'm usually not very obedient, and I feel like I know what's right and what's best for me. But I think I knew that he was the only one that knew what I needed. And so I did exactly what he said, even though it was really, really hard. And I remember walking outside for the first time and I'm thinking we're going to go around the whole block and we go like four or five houses down and McCall's like, okay, let's turn back. And I'm like, no, I need to go more. And I'm walking off the sidewalk because my left side has been compromised. And so everything like, even today, I still have issues with my left hand grip and a few other things, but so, I mean, I would walk off the sidewalk on the left. I couldn't stay in a straight line. And then by the time we turn around five houses later and come home, I am literally exhausted. And this is, you know, three, four months after. Um, anyway, you know, time keeps going. And so I'm, I'm progressing, and I'm actually doing really well. I'm having CT scans every, you know, six weeks. 
I'm going in to see him. I mean, things are looking really great. So six months comes by, and I've, I've been out walking. I am able to do, you know, lift my arms, get dressed, do all that fun stuff, do normal things. I can drive. And I was looking for my forward to my appointment because I was like, okay, this is the appointment where he's going to let me run again. He's going to say, yep, you can go run again. Because I felt like I was getting to the point where I could do it. And I was getting stronger. I mean, I was definitely not nearly close to where I needed to be. But in my mind, I was like, I'm there. So I went in for the doctor's appointment. They had done a CT scan just before that. And here I am thinking I'm going to get the clear all, whatever. And he tells me that I need to go back into surgery again. There's some parts of the dissection where it's, the blood is just not flowing as he would like it and does not want to take any chances and wants to go in and fix some of the areas. And I just, that was like such a blow. I remember crying the whole way home and thinking, I can't have another surgery. I can't go through that again. I've come so far, I can't do it. So I ended up having this surgery, I think like the following week. And I, it was, oh, definitely not. I mean, they didn't have to open up my sternum or anything, but it was like so easy. Not, I don't want to say easy, but it was much easier to recover from that um, than it was the first time around. So I kind of got back, but then it was a huge setback um, for me. So um, I just continued months of cardiac rehab and walking. And, you know, he told me, he said, you know, I just don't think that you're ever going to ski again or ride your bike again or run again because I just, I'm not sure what your, your aorta can withstand and what kind of trauma you can withstand. It's just not worth risking your life for it. So, you know, when he would say stuff like that to me, I would, I knew that he was right. It wasn't worth my life, but it was still hard to accept. And I wanted to do more. And in my brain, I just knew that I could. Um, so I kind of recovered from that surgery and kept going. So, and still went in for all the CT scans. Everything looks great. Everything looks great. Um, we come up to a year. So I'm all like, okay, I'm ready to go. And he just gives me the thumbs down. He's just like, you're not, you're not ready to do that kind of stuff. Or, and I'm not ready to let you do that because he had never had, he's been a cardiac surgeon for 30 plus years and he's a genius. And he, I just, I just got lucky. I got lucky with that guy that he happened to be there when I got to the hospital and he's the one that did the surgery. But he had never had a patient survive this type of dissection. My dis dissection started um, up at the top of the arch, so descending and ascending and down into the aortic valve, which they had to replace my aortic valve, and then my entire aorta all the way down into my abdomen, where everything kind of splits off, has been rebuilt with that graft material. Um, so I'm a little bionic now. <laughs> um, he then just kind of kept a close leash on me. I just feel like he just, he didn't really know. I kept saying, okay, well then when? And he's like, I don't know. I don't know if you're ever going to. And then I would ask him, I'm feeling this way. Is that normal? And he's like, I don't know. I'm like, well, do you know anybody that I could ask? And he's like, I, I just don't, I don't have any patients that I know of that have, you know, been through what you've been through. And you know, I kind of started sharing my story and people are like, you have got to write a book about this. Like there were so many miracles just that first night that happened. I think I've counted like seven or eight that actually had to happen that to save my life. The fact that I went to the ER and the ER doc saw 
or was you know savvy enough to do the CT scan. Um, just so many miracles, and the fact that I got the doctor that I did, and he, I don't see a cardi, I don't see a cardiologist. I only see him because he said I can't hand you off to a cardiologist because they won't know what to do with you. They won't have a clue. He goes, I don't even know what to do with you. <laughs> anyway, um, so the year goes by and still no change. I mean, I can get my heart rate up to 100 and my blood pressure has to stay super low. And you know, with medications that keep your blood pressure low, you become very lethargic and you push through a lot of fatigue, which is my biggest challenge still today. Um, but fast forward, two and a half years later, I go in, I have my CT scan. It wasn't quite two and a half years, it was about two years and four months after. And he walked in and he said, I can't believe I'm gonna say this, but he said, you can go skiing. And it was like in January. And so I was ecstatic. I'm like, are you sure? And he said, yes, but be mindful. I mean, of what you've gone through. So cautious is better. Be mindful of your heart rate and your blood pressure. And as long as you can do those things, I'm happy to let you do them. And that meant riding a bike and running. And I haven't actually become a great runner since. It just like is too hard on my body. But I do ski, I do bike, I mountain bike, and I'm able to do pretty much everything. It's just at a lower level. So I can't, sometimes I have to remind myself <laughs> when I'm out there mountain biking and when I'm up skiing that I have to just kind of hold the reins. Um, no, it has been quite a journey and my life completely changed that day. And you know what, honestly, looking back, and I've said this several times, having that dissection was probably the best thing that ever happened to me because it changed my life. I looked back over like the last 10 years before that of my life and I was living in survival mode. My life was hard. And I was just going through the motion, emotions, or the motions without emotion. And I was just hanging on by my fingertips every single day. And there wasn't a lot of joy in my life. And I didn't even realize it. I mean, I had my kids and you do what you have to do, but I think I kind of like was not really living and when I look back and think, okay, that day that I almost died, which would be October 24th, 2012, and I thought, okay, I just went about my day not thinking that this would be my last day under any circumstances. Like, I had no idea. I mean, I didn't have a thought in my heart to, you know, call my mom or call my siblings or call my kids and you know just tell them I loved them I mean there was not one thing in my mind that even I mean that would never happen and it happened in a heartbeat and my life very well could have been over and I looked back and I thought that would have sucked that would have sucked that that was my last day and I had missed out on so much happiness enjoy in living life and then just enjoying an ordinary day. So, I mean, six and a half years later, every time I climb the stairs in my house, I am so grateful and I do it a hundred times a day. And every single time I think of that day when I came home and how hard that was. And I think of the little things that I am able to do that I that were taken away from me for a short time and then just enjoying life and being happy and you know life is never easy life is hard and 
you have to work hard, that my whole outlook on life just changed to a life of gratitude for what I had and for the day that I had. And there's not a morning that I do not wake up and I open my eyes that I am not grateful to still be here. And I have shared my story and my journey with so many and most of the people that you share your story with are not going to have an aortic dissection, but they are going through struggles in their life. And I knew that I needed to like have the attitude that I wasn't going to be a victim and I wasn't going to feel sorry for myself because of my kids, because I did not want my kids to see me as that. And I have, my life has been so blessed and I have been able to have so many experiences and do so many things since the dissection. I've had doors open. I wrote a book, How My Ordinary Became Extraordinary. Um, I started writing this about a year after, well, it was about nine months after the dissection and it took me um, a year to write it. And it was the second hardest thing I've ever done. Living through the dissection was the first thing. Writing about it was the second one. <laughs> how my ordinary became extraordinary because I talk about just how I wanted an ordinary day back. I just wanted, and the day that it happened was just an ordinary day. It wasn't a party. You know, it wasn't like, okay, this is your last day, live it up. Um, you never know. I mean, you never know when you get that phone call. You never know, you know, when you get diagnosed with an illness or someone that you love. And life is short. And I am just grateful every single day that I have here. And I'll, talk, I'll tell you a little bit about it. I talk a little bit about it in my book, but I um, died a couple of times in the first surgery. And once they lost me for about 26 minutes. And I did have a near-death experience, and I have not talked about it a ton. Like I said, I wrote about it in my book a little bit, but I haven't spoken too in-depth about it until just recently. And you know what? When it's my time to go, I look forward to it. It's a place that we all want to be, and... We're going to be with everybody that we love. And honestly, I remember it's a place that I wanted to stay and I didn't want to come back because coming back meant pain. And I call it the beautiful place. It's the place I call heaven. And it's a feeling like I've never had before. I talk about what it looked like and there's no words to even describe. Um, I used to dream about it all the time and I don't anymore. I miss that I don't. Um, anyway, that experience is near and dear to my heart and I am going to write a little bit more about that um, and those feelings of having a second chance and making a difference and just helping other people, serving other people, and just making time to enjoy life and everything it has to offer. You know, not every day is a great day. I mean, there are bad days, but you know what? I am still grateful for them too. And I... Oh, I'll tell you, you can get my book on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com. And this is it. Um, it's a quick read, and it shows the funny side. It shows the horrible side. It kind of shows all of it. 
and in the back of the book I have because I lost five days I had those people closest to me some friends and family my kids write how this experience affected their life you know from the beginning like what they were feeling and what they were thinking through that five days because they didn't know if I would survive or not and it was touch and go for a long time and you know it's the best part of the whole book because there are things that people wrote in these letters that I would never they would have never told me had I not had them write them down and it was a great it was an amazing experience and I'm grateful for everybody that came into my life to make that happen and I'm looking forward to um, being a support to others going through recovery from a dissection or an aneurysm or pretty much anything else. And that's what we're doing. We're, we're here just for each other. Anyway, I appreciate you taking the time to watch my story. Anyway, I hope you have a great day.